Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, a bi very biased collection, of course. Today I would like to tell you about my favorite constant, or maybe my favorite constant, I haven't decided yet. So zero and one are also really nice constants, there are other nice constants around, um, for example, the golden ratio, or pi, or tau, or e, or you know what constants are. Uh, but these are pretty cool, so chat heat's constants are pretty cool. Actually, I should be really precise here so it's not really one constant it's kind of a, a bunch of constants they depend on the parameter you will see um but i will probably slip quite often and just say the constant so it's but it's not the constant there are many constants and kind of the point will be that okay numerical values will will be different for them they depend on the parameter as i said i will come back to that later but kind of the overall properties are the same anyway. So the parameter doesn't really matter in the end. And kind of what, what the overall properties of those constants is what makes them so ridiculously interesting. They're kind of a measurements of randomness, which is kind of a really, really cool idea if you think about it a little bit. So in the end, you will see what it is and, and it's a really cool idea. Um, just for comparison, so the, the other constants, the classical ones I named, they're pretty old, right? Golden ratio, the one from the pentagon, or pi, the one from the circle, they are, of course, ancient. So they were known to ancient civilizations. Um, e is not as ancient, but basically, as soon as people discovered calculus, people discovered E. So it's whatever, a few hundred years, definitely old by now. Um, but this chatting concept is really really new compared to them and of course one and zero are also pretty old one is much older than zero for some funny reasons um so zero took a little bit to be just really be discovered it's kind of a scary concept to have nothing uh, in some sense but anyway anyway i'm waffling so chatting's concept is much much newer it came up in the last century basically uh, in the 70s of the last century roughly and it's really a bit much more subtle. It's not really related to geometry. It's kind of different. It's related to randomness, if you want, or to computability. Uh, so to kind of more, more like computer science, if you want. And then it's kind of believable that people haven't discovered it very, very early on, because all those concepts that are really, really familiar by now, so randomness or computers or your iPhone or whatever, uh, they were pretty mysterious for a long, long time. And Maybe mysterious is actually the wrong word. They were pretty much ignored for a long, long time. Um, anyway, I'm starting waffling here. So let's just keep going and let's just have a look what this is all about. So the problem here, so I stole this illustration. This is really good from XKCD, um, <laughs> one, of the one of everyone's favorite cartoons probably. And so uh, what I'm trying to explain here is what is called a halting problem. So an HP in my notation today, just an HP. I can't spell, so I just call it HP. Um, and the problem is the following. So you have a given program, whatever that, is, whatever that means, let's just be really hand wavy here right now. Uh, so we have some program, some program that you wrote in some language, and you would like to determine whether it actually stops, whether it holds or not, right? That's called, why it's called the holding, halting problem, right? Whether it stops or not. Could have called the stopping problem as well, but anyway. Um, and well, here's an example. So of course, this is a funny program. It's kind of, kind of a funny illustration. Um, so you, you exit the toilet, you, you find a fountain, you drink, and you don't go to the toilet again. So you're stuck in a loop. So this program will not stop in some sense. Let's have a look at more um, serious examples here. Well, not really. So there's still pseudocode, but uh, much, much more, well, close to what I have in mind than this one here. But I mean, this one is cool, right? This is a really good illustration to keep in mind. Uh, but those two might also be really useful to think of. So here are two programs, really, really small programs in pseudocode, as I said. And well, either it's print hello world, my favorite program of all time, of course, or uh, while true continue. Um, and you want to kind of decide whether it holds or not without really running the program, which is kind of kind of the point here. And the first one will hold, of course, it will just print hello world. And the second one gets stuck in this exactly this loop here, but maybe not exactly in this loop, but it certainly gets stuck in the loop. Uh, so it, it will never hold. That's kind of the, the point, right? Now we have to think about, we have a very, very sophisticated pro program. Um, it's not quite as trivial as hello world. And it's not so obvious whether you can decide whether it holds or not, right? So in particular, a little warning here, there's something called the halting problem. 
um, so the halting problem, not halting problems. And it's kind of saying that there is no general algorithm to decide this. But this, this is not what I'm going to address today. I would just rather, given a specific uh, algorithm program, a, a reasonable one, um, can you actually check whether that holds or not? So um, in this halting problem, the algorithm that doesn't hold is a little bit constructed in the end. You can cook up more real world examples, for sure you can, but um, I'm really looking for something more like print hello world and print hello world is pretty, pretty, uh, well, it's not very, very dangerous, right? It's, it's very harmless. Poor print of hello world. It's, it's very harmless, very innocent. As well. It's kind of the setup here. And well, this is kind of very interesting from the following perspective, which kind of blew my mind. It's very, very simple, but it's kind of very blew my mind when I first heard about it. So um, let's have an example here. So I would like to take gold bus conjecture as an example. So here's the original letter. I, I'm not expecting you to read that. Um, I, I think I never read it myself, but somewhere here on the middle of the page, Goldbach computes his, the conjecture for four, five, and six, which apparently at the time of Goldbach, so this is a letter to Euler. So apparently at that time that counted as a, a conjecture, uh, so counting the subject for four, four, five, and six. Nowadays, you would rather run a computer and make calculations up to God knows how many digits. Anyway, so the conjecture is pretty simple and it's very famous as one of the big open problems in number theory and maybe even in mathematics altogether. Um, it's just the, well, every n bigger than four is the sum of two primes. So basically what Goldbach uh, computes here uh, the prime decompositions as sum of primes, right? Not, not the factoring, the sums of four, five, and six. And yeah, for four, five, and six, it works. So as I said, that was enough somehow to probably, probably they have done more calculations, obviously. But in this letter, you only see four, five, and six. Um, anyway, and this is the letter to oil, as I said. One of the big open problems in number theory. And I think we are well, in 2021, so right now we have 2021, it's end of 2021, but that doesn't change anything. I don't think there will be any solution soon. There was some really, really great progress in the recent years, but um, I don't know. Um, it's, one of the big, it, it's one of the big open problems for a long time, for a reason. So it's probably not very easy to solve. If you don't like God bus conjecture, you can just substitute it for your favorite math theorem, whatever, whatever real life theorem, whatever you want. Um, you will get the point. And the point now is, what does it have to do with what I just told you? Well, there's something called the Goldbach pro program, or actually that's how I call it. That's probably not the standard name. Is, well, how can we actually prove this theorem or conjecture? How can we prove this conjecture? Well, we write a program P that searches for counterexamples. Right? Sounds, sounds reasonable. That's what people do anyway, right? They write programs and they search for counterexamples. And they do that up to a certain bound, whatever. 1 million, probably it's much bigger than 1 million. Probably it's more like 1 million digits. Anyway, um, something like that. You, you kind of search for those counterexamples. And then kind of the halting problem, the gold bus HP is, let's say we could now decide, right? Let's say we could do that, whether my program P stops or not. And we could prove the conjecture because if it stops, then the conjecture is false because it stops if it finds a counterexample, right? And if it does not stop, then we know this conjecture is true because, well, there was no counterexample and this program just runs through all numbers. It kind of, kind of wants to run forever. Uh, as, as so it keeps on searching for counterexamples. And that's pretty cool, isn't it? And many, many, of course, you can just phrase many problems in mathematics or in real life or whatever in such a question, like write a program that kind of searches for counterexamples or something along those lines. And you want to decide whether this program stops or not, right? And if you could decide that, you would have solved the problem, which is actually a pretty cool way of doing it. It doesn't really work. Uh, spoiler here, it doesn't really work, but it would have it would be a pretty cool way of proving those theorems, right? Okay, so let's have a look at what the omega is actually all about. So the Chaitin's constant or Chaitin's constants, uh, whatever. Um, well, let me just let me just say with one the Chaitin omega, um, so omega here is a kind of a very famous thing. It's this number or some computation like this number. I will come back to that later on. Um, and here's what is called the Chaitin's medal. That's what you see right here. The link to the story is in the description, but Chaitin got it uh, as a present for his birthday. I forgot, just forgot which birthday it is, but, um, or was, but uh, link is in the description. And usually you don't get a medal with your own results on it. So this just should tell you a little bit that 
this was a really cool and important observation or definition, if you want. And we'll see that on the next slide. But kind of what I want to keep you in mind, what is the constant, uh, the omega. So now we have a e, a phi, that was the golden ratio, and a pi or tau, whatever you want. That was a circle constant. And we also have an omega, an omega, very nice. And this omega kind of should encode whether a program holds or not, whether programs hold or not. We'll come back to that in a second and make that more precise. But this is kind of the crucial point here. It's kind of this stopping uh, probability of programs is encoded in this number. It will be a probability that kind of spits out, well, how likely it is that the random program will, will stop or not. And the point is, and it's kind of mind blowing, up to a certain, it's really, really mind blowing, knowing enough digits of this number, basically uh, could, you, you could calculate the HP for all programs, which in the end really kind of wants to say that all of mathematics is actually a digit hunt, namely a digit hunt for computing digits of this number. Right? So um, we will see what it actually means. But kind of, if you know enough of those numbers, you have now your Goldbach program that kind of searches for those counterexamples. And well, it will be in the slice of numbers that you just computed, and you could check whether it holds because it's kind of encoded in this constant. So this constant has the potential to solve all problems in mathematics. Again, spoiler, of course, this is life is not so easy. Mathematics is not so easy. This would, won't happen, but it's kind of still a mind blowing concept that you can kind of put all of problems of mathematics into a constant. And that's kind of what it makes it so interesting. So let's have a look at the formal definition, actually. Um, enter the theorem. So this theorem here is kind of um, what we'll see here. Um, so uh, the P is some kind of program expressed in some, whatever, forget it, some kind of program. And there's some U involved. That was the kind of uh, the variable that I mentioned before. It's a certain type of Turing machine. So if you don't know what a Turing machine is, it's actually not so important. I would show you a little mathematical demonstration in a second, but you should think of it like a, a model, mathematical model of computation. So kind of a thing that, that a computer, if you want, kind of the, the, the processor of a computer. Um, and re roughly how it works is as follows. So here's a mathematical link to everything is of course in the description. And it kind of simulates a certain type of Turing machine. And how you should think about it is that it has this little band here, which is kind of an infinite band. And these are my, what is it, my rows of this illustration. Um, we can zoom in a little bit by modifying the widths and get it a little bit bigger. Very good. And whatever, I can, I can move the head position a little bit to the side. So this is where it starts. And there's a certain number of operations that it performs on the band, depending on what it re what it sees. And then it does something and changes the band accordingly. As you can see, it kind of tracks all the way down here. And if you have a brand new random starting position, you actually get very different patterns. It's kind of really just a model of computation. It has this band built in. I will come back to my slides in a second. There's an illustration of such a band. It does some operation on, on this band moves everything a little bit around and um, depending on what kind of input, depending on what kind of uh, position you see at the band, it, it will do some operation. That's exactly what a computer does. Okay, here is the illustration with the band. So kind of you have an infinite infinite band, a big one here and a big one here. And whatever, you can assume that there are colors on it or numbers or whatever, whatever is readable for this machine. And when the machine sees some certain pattern, it does something, that's kind of what it does. And a universal Turing machine, that's kind of what I want, is kind of, kind of, kind of, that is the one that contains all the others. So anyway, so let's come back to the constant. That's defined very nicely, but it, as I said, it depends on this choice of universal Turing machine in a very weak way. So you can kind of ignore it. And it's defined as follows. It's a sum over, well, we have the powers of two to make it converge. And it's kind of the theorem, it actually converges to a number it was in zero and one. So it's really the halting probability. It's a probability that something stops. But it's a probability, it's a number from zero to one, some number. And it's just the sum of all programs of a certain length. You can order them by length, for example. So n is the length, uh, p, uh, number of p is the length of the program. And then it's just two to the minus p. So you number your uh, order your programs by length. That's why you want them to be expressible in a certain standard form. You order them by length, there will be some 
given number of symbols in that program. And well, then you take this, this number two to something that P holds. And it's kind of the, the kind of the theorem is, well, that is, is, this is really, this really works. It's not quite clear why it should converge, but it actually does. And it does converge to a number between zero and one. And it decodes the probability that a random program will hold. That's kind of a funny thing. So uh, how it looks like is kind of a, whatever, in binary form, it would be a zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, something that like, like this one here um, that you see here on this, uh, well, on this metal, but really it's tiny. Some number between zero and one, and kind of the only the only kind of catch is that it depends on you, and this is kind of a cool concept, right? So this is kind of a funny way to define a real number. So let's say everyone has a favorite uh, Turing universal Turing machine here, or something that's called this universal checking machine, or whatever, and um, this machine can kind of now check whether a program holds or not. It's kind of the idea, and it just writes down. Uh, a, a, basically a digit for all programs that hold, right? That's kind of how this is defined. It puts a digit here, P holds for everything that holds. Now you have everything in one number runs over all programs and you get a certain number. And it's the probability that a random program will hold. It's kind of a really amazing concept in some sense. It's really a kind of a number that measures randomness or uh, whether programs stop or not. So in that sense, no enough numbers of this, pro, uh, of this constant whatever the first 1 million digits, for example, um, you would have access now to programs of length, whatever, whatever it is. And you can just easily check whether you're, you're given program or you could in principle check whether you're given program holds or not. That sounds really amazing to me. I, I think it is really, really, really a cool idea. But again, it kind of is obvious from the definition that it took a bit longer to define it uh, compared to something like the golden ratio, right? Okay. Um, so basically, as I said, all of mathematics is kind of encoded in this constant and you could, could decide all of mathematical problems, whatever all means here, of course, um, just doing a digit hunt on this constant. So uh, you might wonder, shouldn't then all mathematicians in this whole world just focusing on computing numbers of this digit? Uh, in principle, yes. In practice, it's just not a good idea. And that's a theorem related to the theorem, which is really, really cool. Um, it's basically saying that th that is hopeless to compute this number. It's a number that you can define. It's a number where you can compute a few digits depending on the Turing machine. For some Turing machines, you can't even compute a single digit. It's kind of kind of built in, into the machine. But anyway, for, for some you can, whatever the first 60 digits or so, um, that, that's just programs that are very, very small anyway. Um, so it doesn't really help. So you can't really compute it. And the formal way of making it the formal way of doing making this precise is as follows. Um, what this omega is what is called a definable number. That's kind of the weakest notion you can expect from a number which is not completely random. So everything out outside here, uh, well, this illustration says it very nicely. We don't have an example here because well, numbers are not definable. So <laughs> I can't even def I can't even write all an example. Um, anyway, so let's go through this list here. So kind of it's it's ordered by complexity if you want. So you have integers, yeah, two, six, something like that. Rationals, constructible numbers. These are numbers that are constructible with uh, straight edge and compass. Uh, here are some examples. Um, a certain type of constructible numbers, algebraic numbers, numbers that are roots of polynomials. Uh, well, whatever, third root of two, for example. You have computable numbers. This is where most of our constants actually live. Uh, this illustration prefers tau over pi, but okay, whatever. So pi would also be here if you want. And these are the computable numbers. Computable, I will come back to that in a second, basically means you have a chance to compute their digits. And omega is even further out. Um, it's not even computable anymore. You could just, you could just define it. That's, that's all that, that is, is, is to say about it in some sense. There's some really cool theorems about omega. Uh, for example, if you like to work in some, some fixed uh, universe for, for set theories, a fixed axiom system for set theory, the most famous one, of course, the Mailer Frankel was choice. Um, and then you can prove, actually, independent of you, you can only determine always the finitely many bits of, pi, uh, of this omega, right? So you can, whatever, you can only determine the first 100 bits anyway. 
Uh, as I said, depending on you, you might actually be really unlucky and it might happen that you, could, you can't compute any single digit of it. Well, you know it's probably a zero point and then it's kind of, you don't know anymore, <laughs> which is kind of a funny statement anyway. Uh, but usually for the kind of the usual machines people uh, use here for those computations, you can compute a few numbers like this one here. I'm, maybe this is actually over, still the state of the art, so I haven't checked. So I, I think the first something like 60 digits Links are in the description, of course. The first 60 digits should be known. And um, this is just, of course, a joke compared to something pi where the whatever millions digit of pi is known. I have to check what the record is for the digits of pi. And I should, personally, I really don't care. Um, the point here is for omega, this is just hopeless. You want, would like to do it because you would like to determine whether your favorite program holds, whether your favorite conjecture is true in some other sense, right? Uh, but you just can't. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It somehow gets even worse. So it's, 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 it's as uh, algorithmically random and not computable. Um, so there's no computable function that ever enumerates the, 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 this, this number. And algorithmically random is a kind of a funny concept, which really tells you that this is really hard to compute. Kind of to get n digits of it, you need to work of order n. That's basically what it says, right? So to get n digits of it, you need to work of order n. <laughs> so it's it's random. So where, where if you know 59 digits, it doesn't help you to determine the 60th digit. If you know 60 digits, it doesn't help you to determine the 61 digit. So it's, it's really kind of a really random number, which is in, really in stark contrast to something like pi. You could just write down the formula for pi. And the question really for pi would be more like, how fast does this formula converge or something like that? But you would still get basically infinitely many digits from one formula. And you could put one formula in whatever, a very, very short program. So a pi is definitely not algorithmically random. Some people like say pi is like a random number, but it's actually not. It's, it's pretty much not random. This one, on the other hand, is random. So as I, I said again, because it's kind of kind of a funny concept. So in order to compute its nth digit, you need to work of order n anyway. No way around. Just a really really crazy number. Okay, um, I hope I convinced you today why this, this these constants they depend on you. I probably always get that wrong. They uh, well, why they are really interesting. Why they're really really new compared to other constants that you see like pi or whatever. And why I really like them. Right, it's a really cool idea actually to put the kind of probability of programs to stop into a number and then it kind of mathematics turns into a digit hunt. Sadly, of course, or maybe luckily, I don't really, I can't really tell whether I should be sad or whether I should be happy. But anyway, you just can't compute this damn fucking number. I shouldn't have said fucking number. I'm very sorry about that. You just can't compute this number. Um, and <laughs> it's just a funny, so it's my favorite example of a random number in a sense of a randomness, in the sense of uh, what is random? Well, if you try to compress an image, for example, and it is random, then compressing won't help because kind of all the data is, is not really accessible. So if you know the, the, the data for one pixel, you just don't know what's happening around because it's random. So any non-random picture, you should be able to actually compress it very well. So it's an uncompressible thing. That's kind of what random is. And this number is uncompressible in the sense that you need to work of order n in order to get n digits, which is really, really different from anything like pi or the golden ratio or whatever you want. Anyway, I hope you like this number, actually. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you next time.